Bedford Square. This really is what Bloomsbury in its heyday was all about. Lovely rows of Georgian houses surrounding a garden. The garden itself providing an oasis against all the hubbub of urban life and aesthetically pleasing as well. These marvellously elegant Georgian houses are a superb example of how the great families of England, in this case, notably the Russells, Dukes of Bedford, laid out their estates. It's seen some extraordinarily famous people. The home of Forbes Robertson is here, the Lord Chancellor of England, Lord Eldon, lived here, and on that side, Lady Ottoline Morell, who threw those marvellously extravagant and opulent parties for the cognoscenti of the day. But my view of Bloomsbury begins somewhere else and is a little less grand. Cromer houses, where I came to live when I was very young, and from that window where you can see the red geraniums, I used to throw flower pots onto the heads of the unsuspecting passers-by, and one of them happened to be Florrie Plume, who was a great friend of my mother's, and she said afterwards, it was the only wear in that thick felt hat that saved me from a terrible injury from your boy. My missile throwing was not the result of wickedness. It was simply because I suffered from insomnia, and frankly, I still do. There you are, you see, an enclosed community, and built like the squares of Bloomsbury were built on the principle of the interior quadrangle. Here are the walls providing shelter from the wind and the open space in the center. I'm not trying to romanticize these living conditions, of course. When they were built, there were no bathrooms, and my mother had to make do with one tin bath hanging up behind the, the kitchen door, and of course the rooms were cramped, but they were not jerry-built. They stood the test of time marvellously, and on these balconies there was a great deal of good neighbourliness, and probably a lot more friendliness than you'd find in your present modern high-rise blocks. And we didn't have far to go to school. It was on that roof that I rehearsed Princess Angelica in Thackeray's Rose and the Ring. Very good notices I got for it, too, deservedly. At the back here of the playground was the old Regent Theatre, which is now gone, and you'd think, wouldn't you, that they were going to build places for the homeless with the kind of housing problem they've got in this area. Well, they're not. This is to be an extension for the town hall. They've got three blocks in the same road already, so instead of places for the homeless, there'll be bureaucrats discussing the plight of the homeless. The whole thing lies in the fairy-like turrets and splendours of St Pancras Station, designed by Gilbert Scott, who did the Albert Memorial. There were incredible scenes at the opening, and cries and sobs of, Oh, it's too beautiful! As, of course, for the London and North Eastern Railway, it certainly was. One of the pleasures of growing up in Bloomsbury was being surrounded by these lovely squares and their gardens, like the garden in Tavistock Square with its statue of Mahatma Gandhi. When these estates were originally laid out, the great landlords, like the Russells, leased the houses rather than sold them in the interests of preserving the symmetry of the squares and the architectural harmony. But sadly, leases don't last forever, and many of them have been ruined. Look at Russell Square. On that side, there's nothing now except a vast sort of laboratory in concrete for London University. Next door to that, a huge office block. Here, nothing but office conversions. And very dreary of that. How sad they all look. And where there was once this wonderfully extravagant facade of the old Imperial Hotel with architectural conceits all over it, you've now got this bed and breakfast vulgarity, which will be more at home in the Costa del Sol. I mean, Torremolinus is full of this kind of rubbish. Thank goodness. They've left the Russell Hotel alone, which has four charming niches housing Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary, Queen Anne, and of course, Queen Victoria. Woburn Square has been hopelessly bashed about, and by the London University, because not content with taking over houses for departments of this and departments of that, they've actually bashed the houses down. And to make way for what? Well. This sort of thing, which doesn't even belong in an area like this. 
and that appalling conglomerate mass of concrete behind there, well, that has nothing to do with Bloomsbury at all. And there used to be a lovely little church there, a, a charming little Gothic church with a tower that almost dominated the square. And now, apart from the portico, there's nothing left. The tentacles of London University seem to have spread even to here, Gordon Square. And though no one seems to actually reside here anymore, I can never walk these pavements without thinking of those incredible and eccentric and brilliant people who once did live here. I think of Virginia Woolf and Leonard Woolf, who ran the Hogarth Press and printed, incidentally, the first edition of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, and the Strachey family, who were so intimately connected with the Spectator, whose offices in Gower Street are just uh, over the way, even to this day. I once knew a lady who had to read to old Lady Strachey, who was rather deaf, and she said, I called out to her, I won't bother with the chapter headings, Lady Strachey, and the reply was, well, they're the only bits I enjoy. And here we are at the house in which Lytton Strachey lived. Lytton, that lovable eccentric. I think of Lytton at the conscientious objector's tribunal with his inflatable rubber ring saying, it's the piles, the dreadful piles. And when his Rolls Royce failed to start saying, we'll have to turn it into a greenhouse. The Lytton Strachey's and their friends, Maynard Keynes, Roger Fry, E.M. Forster, all of them seem to epitomise Bloomsbury intellectually. And within a few yards of here, the architectural apotheosis of Bloomsbury itself, the British Museum. It was a fine Greek facade, as you can see. It was designed by the Smirk brothers. The whole thing's really a crib from the Parthenon. And it's ironic that this museum should house the Elgin marbles, those curious pieces of statuary which were in the frieze originally of the Parthenon itself. In the Assyrian section here is a fine head of Hadrian, who ruled over us as proconsul and built that incredible wall from Solway to Tyne against the barbarians. And that's a Greek word that was coined by the dwellers of the city-state in derision of those outside who looked after the sheep and they said could only make noises like sheep and went bar bar, thus barbarian to indicate all the uncivilized values, as opposed to Hadrian who was eminently civilized and dead right for Bloomsbury. wanted to build a museum up around the nucleus of reproducing pianos, which of course are the most important item, so to speak, in the museum. Uh, we've added to the museum since all of these other instruments, which of course are not reproducing ones, but which nevertheless are very attractive. Now we have husbands and wives who come along here. The husband might come along to have a look at the works in the piano, whereas the wife likes the music.
In about 1890, Henry Conrad Sandell emigrated from Sweden to America. In four, three years, between 1904 and 1907, he contrived the whole of this instrument with the Mills Novelty Company in Chicago, here where he worked. Out on the left here are the weights which keep the strings of the violin at constant tension, regardless of atmospheric conditions. This is the afterplay mute. Here in the center are the fingers which stop off the strings from underneath, like that, instead of on top as usual. Here is the automatic resin device which comes down in between the tunes. And a very clever violin it is too. It can play both outside strings at once if it wants to. You try that with a bow. I found th this church. Uh, they were stored in vicarages and garages all over the country. And then one day I noticed a, uh, a piece in the paper about there being 800 redundant churches. So I started looking around. In the end, I was successful in getting this one down in Brentford. It was in a shocking condition when, when I first came into it. The roof was leaking, the pews were awash, the hymn books were thrown all over the place by vandals, the organ pipes were out, some of the windows were out. The floor blocks were all up. I think the vandals will be coming back to set fire to them, but luckily they didn't. Um, anyhow, after going up on the roof and repairing the leaks myself, I eventually got an old pensioner who came along and helped for a year or two. And then now we're quite well, very well set up with a fine band of voluntary helpers who come along and just love doing the work and uh, establishing the museum on even a firmer basis still. cricket is the best form of cricket there is, a classless game played by sturdy yeomen and country vicars, by men on the dole and well-to-do commuters. It's a game in which accent and income count for nothing, and the only men worth knowing are those who score a few runs, take a few wickets, and manage somehow to hold their catches. 
In recent years, this most satisfying form of the most beautiful of all games has been given particular significance by the Hague Village Cricket Championship, a knockout competition which culminates on August the 30th with the final at Lords, the mecca of all cricketers everywhere. This year, 808 teams took part, teams with glorious names like Nettlebed and Old Botley, Burnt Yates and Thorpe Hesley, Chadsley Corbett and Colpitt Heath, Tolsant Darcy and Hellions Bumpstead. You could write poems about names like that, and John Betchman probably has. Well, this Sunday, eight of those teams will be fighting out the quarter-finals, and if one of the games is in your district, rush to the ground and shout for your local side. If the match is anything like the one we saw in the area finals between Langleyberry of Hertfordshire and Ireland of Cambridgeshire, you'll see a contest of fluctuating fortunes between men of steely determination and rugged skill fought to an exciting and, I fear, slightly bitter conclusion. Nobody's got any sleep here this afternoon because of the excitement of the game, but I gather you don't get any sleep on the night before the game either. No, I don't get a lot. I, you know, you usually try and think how the game's going to go and toss and turn for most of the night. In fact, this morning I finished up in the bath with cramp, believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. time was this? Well, this is about 20 past six, I suppose, and uh, I come straight back, went to bed, and damn if I didn't dream about the game, in between that time, I was having a row with my brother and Jeff Reddick. <laughs> I most probably will after this game tonight now. But why, why do you get so worked up? Because, you know, people will say, well, it's only a game. Well, I think the thing is, you know, they, they rely on me being the main bowler, you know, and they, the, the pressure's on me, and yet I feel, I feel for the other lads, you know, because they, they get so keyed up and nervous in the game. And, I mean, I've seen positions where we've handed the ball to a fella and he, his hand's gone <laughs> like that when he's got a ball. You know, it's unbelievable how it gets you sometimes, you know. Gordon, do you feel the same way? Do you get that kind of tension? Um, yeah, much the same, really. It's, uh, I think it's the fact that you've, got, you've just got one chance of, the, of getting uh, two laws. This is what we, everybody dreams about, isn't it, if you play cricket? And, you know, at this level, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful dream, isn't it? Yes. And you feel if you lose out on, on this particular game, that's it. There was a year when one of the sides that reached the Hague final included about nine men who'd played minor counties cricket. We true village cricketers Whoa. disapprove of that. The true village cricketer dreams of playing for his minor county the way a first-class cricketer dreams of playing for England, and with even less chance of fulfilment. But Langleyberry and Ireland, now they're real village sides. And what a game they put on, and what a finish they provided. Each side, according to the rules, bowled 40 overs, and round about 7 o'clock, we came to the 80th and last over of the match. Six balls to go, and Langleyberry needing three to win. Well, two would be enough if they could level the scores and still have a wicket in hand. But alas, it was not to be. Off the last ball, the 480th ball, they still needed two. They ran one, they tried for a second, but the throw was quick and accurate, the wicket was down, the last man was run out, and Ireland had won by one run. Well, nothing could be more exciting than that. But as I said, there was bitterness too. The turning point of the game had come a few overs earlier, with another run out. Langleyberry's skipper, all fierce concentration and bristling moustache, had looked to be winning the game when the rival captain and wicketkeeper hurled the wicket down and he was given out. To no avail did Langleyberry protest, 
that their captain had merely strayed from his crease to pat the pitch. Whatever the moral rights or wrongs of the situation, he had to go. We Hertfordshire men didn't think much of that. Not on, we said. Not cricket, we muttered into our beer. But there you are, there was nothing we could do about it. Nothing, that is, except congratulate Ireland and dream about next year. I should like to thank Langley Bear for a great game. I'm sorry we part hard, but that's our way. <laughs>